Hi everyone. Welcome to week 5 of the Social Psychology of Work. We are not done with Goffman just yet. This week, we'll be learning about another of his books. This one is called Frame Analysis. Remember that the presentation of self used the metaphor of the theater. In contrast, Frame Analysis is based on the idea that our interactions are like a movie, with scene after scene of activity. Actually, I've not read the whole book, but the professor has, so I'll let him tell you about it. Catch you later. Wait a minute. Irving, did you just say that you haven't even read Frame Analysis? What the hell, bro? When you interviewed for this job as my teaching assistant, you told me that you'd read it and you could easily talk about it to the rest of the class. You duped me. Well, I guess you were just fostering a false impression of reality to define the situation in a manner such that I would give you the job. And since you're just a figment of my imagination, and because your fabrications led to a good teachable moment, I forgive you. And honestly, I don't even blame you for not reading frame analysis. Here it is. As you can see, it's a pretty thick book. There are about 600 pages here or so. That's why I've not insisted that everyone read it. Now, don't get me wrong, it is a really interesting book, but whereas the language in the presentation of self is fairly light and playful, the language in frame analysis is dense and sometimes hard to understand. It's not an easy book to read, and for this reason, I'm only asking that you read chapter one of frame analysis, which I've posted for you on the LMS. That should give you a little flavor of what this book is about, and you can learn about the rest of it from this week's set of lectures. Now, I think Goffman considered frame analysis to be his magnum opus, whereas the presentation of self was published in 1959 when he was just a PhD student, uh, frame analysis was published in 1974. So this represents Goffman's mature ideas. But it never quite caught on like the presentation of self did. It's not his most popular book, and again, I think this is probably because it's pretty hard to read. But it is filled with philosophical brilliance, and there are also moments of humor. As Irving, my avatar, just said, in this book, Goffman has moved on to use the metaphor of a movie. So we're still actors or performers in his mind, but life is now conceptualized as a never-ending film. Okay, why don't we get started with the lecture? Cheers. Okay, welcome to your first lecture on frame analysis. Remember to read chapter one of the book and I've placed a PDF of this chapter on the LMS for you. I think you're really going to enjoy this set of lectures. As always, I've selected a series of short clips that illustrate some of the concepts that Goffman proposes. And I think they're pretty entertaining, but you can be the judge of that. Well, let's not beat around the bush. How about we just jump right in, eh? What is going on here? Now, when we enter a social situation, we have, I think, an innate drive to understand what's going on. We want to know what's going on. And sometimes we even ask others when we walk into a social situation, hey, what's going on? You know, what's going on here? Other times we try to figure it out for ourselves, looking for visual cues or maybe just listening to others for a while to get a sense of what's going on. Now, Goffman begins frame analysis by asking a very important question. Under what circumstances do we think things are real? Think about that for a moment. Under what circumstances do we think things are real? It's a profound philosophical question. In fact, it's probably the most 
profound philosophical question ever. How do you know what's real and what's not real? What about Irving, my avatar? Is he real? How do you know what makes him real? The key point Goffman makes in this respect is that what's really happening is usually much more complex than we think. Now, you can probably see the influence of the presentation of self in everyday life on this theory. There are illusions everywhere, lies and fabrications. And the audience may think that they're real, but that doesn't make them real. Defining realness is a difficult business. Now, according to Goffman, there are three types of problems when it comes to defining what's real. Firstly, there are problems of perspective. For example, what is experienced as play for a golfer is simultaneously experienced as work for a caddy. Or the execution of justice for a victim's family may be perceived as injustice for the perpetrator's family. Or work may be perceived as exploitation by a worker, but as kindness and generosity by the employer. So we all play different roles, and with these roles come different perspectives about what's going on. Secondly, there are problems of multiple interpretations. For example, what is perceived as simple, harmless teasing by some people may be perceived as brutal bullying by other people. Or, for example, when a parent disciplines a child, the parent is usually doing it out of love, but the child is unable to see that reality. Thirdly, there are problems of what Goffman calls retrospection. And this is where the meaning of a situation changes over time. For example, when I was an undergrad, like you, when I was a student, I took a class that I absolutely hated. I thought the professor was the worst professor I'd ever had, and that she was way too harsh. But looking back at it now, I can see that I learned more from that class than any other class I took at university. In other words, what I thought was the worst class I'd ever taken became, in retrospect, the best class I'd ever taken. So, basically, it's extremely hard to pin down the reality of what's going on. It may be only a joke, a dream, an accident, a mistake, a misunderstanding, or a deception. To illustrate this point, I've selected a clip from the show Curb Your Enthusiasm. In it, Larry David turns an accident or a mistake into an act of bravery, which the audience accepts as an act of bravery, but in fact, this doesn't correspond to the reality of the situation, as you'll see. Enjoy. Are you really pushing my drink back? Encroachment. Encroachment? Yes, you're encroaching. Oh, I'm... Sorry. That's a penalty. <clears throat> Passage of penalty. Look at this. Look at the size of these laces. Have you noticed that they're making laces much longer than they used to? I'm just... I'm actually trying yeah. to read something, so... Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to disturb you. I could do better than this. I'll pick it up. Excuse me. Do you 
mind my asking where you're going? Oh, I was going to go to the bathroom. This bathroom is for coach passengers only. Really? Who said that? Um, earlier I tried to use the one up there, and I was told that, you know, coach isn't allowed to use first class, so oh. I, we have our different areas. I am so sorry that they did that. That's terrible. Thank you for understanding. So. Well, I understand, and I and I empathize with you that you. that you weren't allowed to do that, but I'm still going to use the bathroom. Why would, why? I didn't stop you from oh, using that bathroom. Oh, because you're in first class, so you get to do whatever you want to do. Not at all. You get on first, no, you, you yeah. get free drinks, no, you get a hot towel. No. You... Just because I'm sitting up there, you're making a generalization about me, but I'm not like a first class person. I'm, I'm, I'm coaching. Really I'm just coaching. that you're not acting coaching. I didn't you're not stop acting you. You're coaching. You're acting you're not first acting classy. Coaching. I'm because... coaching. No, but you just think you care. get to walk back here. I'm you got it all wrong, okay? Oh, I'm sure that you'd I do. You'd be up, I'm you'd be up in first class. Poor, if somebody bought you a ticket, oh, you'd be up there in the second. Class. Oh, poor little coaching girl. <laughs> She's so <laughs> jealous because everybody else is more comfortable than so the coaching girl in first class. I just want to be somewhere because everywhere. Because I am nothing. Really <laughs> Bless. Bless. Yes, sir, can I help you? Yeah, I'd like another drink, please. Um, I actually think you might have had enough. No, I don't want water. I said scotch with two ice cubes, yes, no water. But I cannot serve you any more alcohol. What? For Christ's sake, I'll get it myself. Where's the drinker? Shut up! Get out of my face and oh, say Oh, you get out of my now. face. Just get the I'm fucking going. drink. That is it. I'm going to speak to the no, captain. No, I am going to speak to the cap. Why can't I have another fucking oh. drink? Ah. Oh, oh, God. I'll oh, stop. Oh, please don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Oh, I'll go back to my seat. Please don't hurt me. I, I, I just, it was... No, don't total, hurt me anymore. You know, I didn't really... Oh, thank you, what? sir. That, that man was abusive and he was drunk. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Trying to help them. I was helping out. Somebody had to help them. Oh, please. Oh, my. Oh. oh my. What happened? That was you? That was me. I jumped on him. Crazy. Yeah. What motivated you? Uh, you know, uh, I, I was abusing the stewardess and... Uh, I just did it. Look at you. Yeah. So not like you. How about you. that? I didn't even think about it, really. Oh, wow. God. You're very brave. Huh. You are. You're a hero. No, I do, I suppose. I'm Donna, by the way. Oh, hey. Larry. Larry. Thank you. Okay, so Goffman argues that primary frameworks are the first layer of perceived reality. A primary framework is, in many ways, equivalent to a scene in a movie. The primary frame allows us to locate, perceive, identify, and label a situation. It's essentially the setting and context of social interaction. Goffman argues that primary frameworks can be natural, for example, the weather, or social, for example, a report about the weather. The workplace can also be a primary framework. Interaction might take place on the factory floor, a retail space, or a back office. All of these are potential primary frameworks that anchor our behaviors and activities. Primary frameworks can also be extremely complex because in one scene, there can be several other scenes unfolding simultaneously. Thus, there are often what Goffman calls scenes within scenes. For example, imagine a retail shop where a woman is purchasing a good from an employee. This is the primary framework. But within this primary framework, there may be subplots or different scenes. Maybe as the woman is purchasing the good, her children are fighting with each other. Or maybe some other customers are stealing something from the store. 
each scene within a scene adds an extra layer of complexity. Goffman argues that these primary frameworks help us to organize and understand our experiences. He also argues that a group's framework of frameworks is its overarching system of beliefs. That is to say, a framework of frameworks is essentially the group's culture. It provides a common background and shared background assumptions that allow everyone to understand one another within the group. Now, are you bearing with me? Because it's going to get even more complicated. Now Goffman goes on to define the process of what he calls keying. So keying refers to the process whereby an activity is transformed, altered, or copied so as to change the meaning of the activity from a real activity to a staged or an artificial activity. So you're taking a primary framework and mimicking it in some way. He distinguishes between different forms of keying. Make-believe keys involve the imitation of an activity just for fun or for entertainment. This is like a playful copying of serious or real behavior. Let me give you some examples of make-believe keys. Sometimes friends might pretend to fight each other. They don't mean to hurt each other, but they still mimic the fighting for fun. Or, for example, sometimes coworkers will imitate obnoxious customers. A customer might be acting obnoxiously for real in the primary framework, but the coworkers then might make fun of him or her by imitating them behind the scenes in front of each other. Or, for example, let's say you were talking with your friends about your nerdy social psychology of work professor. Then you imitate me as a way of showing them just how nerdy I am. This is an example of make-believe keys. Contest keys are sporting events that simulate real combat. For example, a boxing match is a contest key. The fighters are not trying to kill each other, but they are mimicking violent fighting. Or maybe you've seen those fake sumo costumes that people wear and pretend to sumo wrestle with each other. Rehearsal keys refer to the practicing of a certain behavior to prepare for the real thing. This might include, for example, a lawyer doing a mock trial a flight simulator for pilots in training, or maybe an awkward teenager who practices kissing his own arm to prepare for the real thing, or going through a job interview in front of a mirror beforehand. Demonstration keys are when a task is performed out of context. An example here might be a vacuum salesperson who intentionally drop some dirt on the floor just to demonstrate to a customer how well the vacuum works. Now, what's interesting about primary frameworks is that they can be keyed, rekeyed, and re-rekeyed, etc., etc. This involves adding different layers, or as Goffman calls it, laminations, to the original activity, to the primary framework. For example, maybe a play fight among friends turns into a real fight, or maybe a salacious and romantic workplace affair turns into an acrimonious sexual harassment claim. The point is, if you have the primary frameworks here as the reality, then through keying, the reality changes into something else. Now, satire is often a good example of keying. For example, the following video takes Star Wars, the movie, as the primary framework and then keys it into something different. Now this is a great example of make-believe keying. The video was made just for fun and entertainment. Now I should warn you that the following video is violent and contains a profligate use of obscene language. So if you are easily offended, then I encourage you 
to simply skip forward by 45 seconds. As with the presentation of self in everyday life, frame analysis also highlights the importance and the prevalence of fabrications in social interaction. Goffman defines fabrication as a falsification of reality. He then goes on to distinguish between various types of fabrications in social interaction. A benign fabrication is a fabrication that is designed to protect others. For example, imagine a family who keeps a shameful secret from their mother because they know it will upset her, like if one of her sons is arrested for pedophilia. There is also playful deceit or kidding. This is when false realities are created just for the sake of humor. Virtually every sitcom on television is based on this kind of fabrication. Then there are training hoaxes. These are specially designed instructional fabrications. Imagine, for example, a spy who is sent out on a very important mission only to later find out that it was just a training exercise all along. Similarly, there are fabrications that are vital tests of loyalty. An example of this might be a company who sends in spies posing as troublesome customers in order to see how employees will respond. Goffman defines an exploitative fabrication as a fabrication that is designed to achieve personal gain at the expense of others. Examples here might include businesses that use false advertisements, or deliberate misrepresentations, or people who cheat, illegal mimicry like pretending to be a police officer, or investigators that plant evidence, or those who blackmail others with false facts. An unintentional falsification is a fabrication that is based on delusions or mental illness. The fabricator in these instances cannot be blamed for the fabrication. Goffman points out that all fabrications and false designs are subject to discrediting. Finally, he defines suspicion as when a person thinks or begins to think that a strip of activity may be a plot to dupe, mislead, or contain him or her. Okay, I now want to give you an example of a fabrication, and this would fit in the context of deceit, playful deceit, or kidding. This is an interesting example because it brings in the concept of keying as well. This clip is from Saturday Night Live, and Again, it's a keying of Star Wars. But it's also a keying of a real television show in America called Undercover Boss. So in this clip, you'll see how keyings and rekeyings based on fabrications are or can be pretty funny. Have a look for yourself. Each week. We follow the boss of a major organization as they go undercover to find out what's really going on in their company. This is Undercover Boss, Star Killer Base. Kylo Ren is the commander of the First Order, a massive regime dedicated to wiping out the Galactic Resistance. This Kylo is going undercover among Star Killer Base personnel as Matt, a radar technician. You get so caught up in restoring the galaxy to its rightful state that you miss what's going on behind the scenes. 
I'm looking forward to having some real talk with some real folks. We've put hidden cameras in an employee common area, and no one has any idea that Matt is their boss, Kylo Ren. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm a radar technician. You guys like working here? You know, work is work. Yeah, totally. What do you guys think of Kylo Ren? Do you guys believe when he says that he's going to finish what Darth Vader started? What exactly has he started? You know, I will say this for Kylo. I think he gets a bad rap. What? Yeah. He's trying to accomplish something that's never been done in the history of the galaxy. You know? Ridiculous. Rule everything? That's impressive. I, I admire the guy. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, okay. It's real easy. All you got to do is rewire the calcinator. So, remove... This? Does that look like the calcinator? What's wrong with you? Why, why it's so hard for you to understand? I don't know, but can you please stop yelling me? You're starting to stress me out. I have a newfound respect for what my employees do. Okay, now can we rewire it, please? So I can go have my muffin. I haven't had a muffin yet, Matt. It's not as easy as I presume. Hey, you kicked my wrench. Jerk face. Have you guys seen Kylo Ren's lightsaber? Yeah, man, that thing's weird looking. No, it's not. It's awesome. Here, let me go see if I can find it. I'll show it to you. Look, I found Kylo Ren's lightsaber. Whoa. Look at it up close. Dude, that thing looks dangerous, man. Poorly made. The little kid made it. They don't have to look at it anymore! Uh, I, I'm 90% sure Matt is Kylo Ren. Yeah, this is... Uh actually been a rough year for my family. We lost our son back in April. He was in the Stormtrooper program, and um, we're getting by. Wow, well, man. Sorry about that. Must be hard hearing that Zach lost his son. Really struck a nerve with me. Especially since I'm the one that killed him. Hey. I ran into Kylo Ren in the bathroom. He told me to give you this. After the rain comes the rainbow. Sorry, I killed your son. Kylo. This means something to me now. A buddy of mine saw Kylo Ren take his shirt off in the shower, and, and he said that Kylo Ren had an eight pack. But Kylo Ren was shredded. What? Your friend's a liar, man. Kylo Ren is a punk bitch. That guy looks like he weighs 30 pounds soaking wet underneath that little black dress. <laughs> Tim? Tim! Oh no, he's choking on food. I see what's in your mind. It is stupid! Dude, Matt straight up sucks. I have a bombshell announcement to make, guys. I'm not Matt. I'm, I'm Kylo, Kylo Ren. Ren. You're Kylo Ren. You're Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren. Oh. I knew when you threw me through the soda machine. I knew from hi, I'm Matt. <laughs> We're really connected today. I'm promoting you to superior officer. Thank you, sir. I had a blast today. I really learned a lot, and people are going to love the new me. I've always loved that clip, and it's just so dramaturgical. Okay, this part of frame analysis is clearly derived from Goffman's earlier work in the presentation of self in everyday life. He argues here that we are all like stage performers and or audience members in turn. Now, whereas a theater performance is an actual play, a personal performance is like a mini dramatic play in real life. But there are now, according to Goffman, some key differences between a theater performance and a personal performance. For example, in a play, all activity and dialogue is important. But in our personal performances, much, really if not most, of our activity and dialogue is insignificant. In theater, the dialogue is always witty and clever. 
but in real life, actors are clumsy and boring. In theater, actors on stage face the audience when they talk, whereas in our personal performances, we face each other when we interact. The setting on stage is clearly fabricated, whereas the primary frames in real life are only partially under the control of the actors. But there are also some clear similarities with the presentation of self in everyday life. We rehearse productions off stage and we play roles. There is an information asymmetry between the actors and the audience where the actors know the truth of what's going on and the audience often doesn't know. But there are also some differences with the presentation of self. Namely, as I just described, Goffman now realizes that the theater metaphor no longer works perfectly because theater interaction is not exactly like real interaction. Another crossover from the presentation of self in everyday life is the idea of containment. To be contained means to be tricked, duped, manipulated, or misled in some way. Containment refers to the subterfuges that are employed in social interaction to alter others' perceptions of what's going on. Goffman identifies several forms of containment. First is secret monitoring, which means covert surveillance of another. This involves, for example, police wiretapping, or when companies spy on suspected insurance frauds who claim to be injured. Penetration refers to secret agents sent to infiltrate another team. An example of penetration might include when an undercover cop poses as a criminal in order to capture evidence against the real criminals. As a general rule, the container generally has more power than the contained, in much the same way that a team has an advantage over the audience. Occasionally, frame reversal occurs. This is when the container becomes the contained. This is the plot of many movies that have an exciting twist. For example, the main character thinks she's manipulating someone else, but it later turns out that she's the one that's been manipulated the whole time. Then there is what Goffman calls mutual containment. This is when actors simultaneously contain each other. Now, virtually all of Shakespeare's plays are stories of mutual containment. A containment competition is when both parties know that they are trying to contain each other. Again, this is a classic plot in many movies. Okay, that draws part one of this lecture to a close, and I'm now going to hand it over to Irving, my avatar. He's going to explain what you need to do for this week's online exercise in the LMS forum. I'll see you in a bit. Bye for now.